Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All praise belongs to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We welcome you back to today's episode insha'Allah where we're looking at Islamic history, discussing the finer points of the, the legacy of Islam, taking a look at the lessons that we can learn from history and all the, the, you know, the points of benefit that are found throughout all of the history books insha'Allah. Now we're looking at the second part of Al-Andalus. Yesterday, we looked at the conquest of Al-Andalus. We talked about how the Iberian Peninsula, which is uh, Spain, Portugal, and even parts of southern France, came under the control of the Muslims. However, the conquest wasn't so easy as to not have had any problems. We see perhaps the most major problem that the Muslims started to fall into, and we found this in Italy. We, we find this many times in Islamic history is that after the conquest, after the high point, the Muslims begin to become disunited. We find in Andalus, many of the different Arab groups migrated to different cities. You found you had the Berbers in the north who were on the front lines fighting, and they decided to come back to take the cities so that they could share in the wealth. And so the people started to become disunited. People from one city would say, this is my tribe. These are my people. We speak this language. Over petty things. Over very, I'm, in the grander scheme, you, f you find them to be petty things. I mean, would you prefer to be united and have a strong country? Or would you prefer to let it all go just to have a few extra dollars in your pocket? This is because uh, Iman is not strong in this time? It, it, no doubt Iman plays a part in this. But the problem is that even if you have 90% of the people strong, pious, with Iman, with good faith, you only need 10% to start making problems. And this is part of the problem. And the, the, the leader of the Muslims, he couldn't really control the desires of the people. You know, the Berbers, they would say, for example, we did all the fighting. Where's our recompense? And you can see, like, for myself, I see some justification in what they were asking for. But at the same time, in the grander scale of things, of course they should have put their desires so, away. So we see what actually happened at this point was civil war broke out in Al-Andalus. Was the disunity in Spain more on tribal issues, unlike Italy, which was uh, uh, basically sec religious sects? This is a very, very good point. As we saw in Italy, you had, for example, the Sunni and the Shia. And this was the main difference, that the Sunnis would fight the Shia. In Spain, however, in Al-Andalus, you found it was pretty much only along ethnic lines. All of Al-Andalus at this point belonged to Ahlus Sunnah. The Shia, they, they barely existed in North Africa at the time. So you found that people were looking at themselves as a Berber first. They were looking at themselves as an Egyptian in Andalus, a Syrian in Andalus. And that's why you started to find that they became disunited. And that this disunity, it became so extreme that it wouldn't just be, I want my city to be stronger than yours. There is any wars between two Muslims in the same country in this time? This is what actually broke out. You had civil war. Once Al-Andalus was united, after being conquered, we looked at the beautiful story of these people, these brave soldiers, Tariq ibn Ziyad, rahimahullah, Musa ibn Nusayy, rahimahullah. These brave men and how they united the Muslims. But after this, they became disunited and they broke up into approximately 15, even more than 15, they were called a Ta'ifa. Ta'ifa is like a small state. So Andalus wasn't one nation at this point. In the beginning it was. But then they broke up into approximately 15 smaller states. This is after Omeyyads. No. That, 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 uh, this is the time of Ta'ifas. I think that is after Omeyyads. Uh, yes, this was after the initial conquests. This is when they started to break up. After, as we mentioned, the Muslims were pushed back from the Battle of Poitiers in Tours, after this is when the Muslims started to become disunited and to fight amongst one another. Was it more about race or was it more about nationalism? It essentially is the same thing. 
and you can you look at yourself even though you're not in your own country you'd look at yourself as a Syrian before being a Muslim and this is what you find amongst uh, many of the immigrant communities in the West especially I mean you have for example in Australia you'll have Somalis Indians Lebanese Turkish they all immigrate to Australia problem today uh, in uh, in Arab communities in the USA they, they, they said uh, for example I'm first I'm Egyptian but after that Arabic and the, fir the first place Muslim I think it must be the first Muslim the second maybe nation uh, but uh, and the third uh, ethnic I don't first Islam is second first Islam, Islam yeah. third Islam <laughs> the problem is when the people start immigrating to a new land like Andalus like Australia like the USA what happens is they will begin to still view themselves as their nationality back home. So you find the people in Andalus, especially the people from Damascus, they would say, I am from Damascus. You are from North Africa. We're different. I want to be separate from you. And so they broke up into their smaller taifas. Now what happened? The problem here, remember we said you had in the northwest of Al-Andalus, in the Asturias, you still had a Christian nation. The Christians hadn't been fully defeated. So now you've got these 15 to 20 smaller Muslim nations. All of them are far too weak to fight the Christians. Remember what we saw in Italy, Even disunity. Combined. Even combined, did you two? Or? This is the problem. If they were combined, they would be the one nation. But they began to become disunited into these smaller nations. So they became so small and so weak that they couldn't fight the Christians. And what about the Khalifa? in Arab land or in Muslim land what he not give they had cut themselves off completely from the Khalifa mm. one the moment you're going to disunite you're not going to want to unite with anyone except your own group this is the problem that the majority of them found so much so you'd have the Christians invading a land and all the Muslims had to do was call to the few other Taifas and say let us unite and fight them together so at this point was it still an Andalusia or was it separated completely and it wasn't considered that the name of the, the area as a whole was Andalus, mm. but it was broken up into smaller, it's called a Ta'ifa, you can call them smaller kingdoms, mm. smaller realms. Each one was autonomous, each one had their own ruler. And as we said, the problem was their, their pride was so strong, they wouldn't call on their own brother to defend him. And, and of course, the, the Christian kingdoms took advantage of this uh, disunity and played you know, one Muslim kingdom against the, the other. Exactly. We saw how the Muslims went into Andalus when the Christians became disunited. When the Muslims took Sicily in Italy that we mentioned uh, two days ago, exactly the same thing. The Christians were disunited, the Muslims came in. Now you find it's happening to the Muslims. They became disunited. And again, their, their pride, their ego was too strong to unite with their brother. So you found that the Christians started to take more lands. They would conquer Ta'ifa after Ta'ifa to the point that the Muslims were being pushed back almost out of Andalus. Maybe they were, they were also feared uh, to lose a power because uh, when, uh, maybe when my uh, neighbor helped me, maybe he'll took my, my power. This so is exactly that, the problem. They were selfish uh, and greedy. This is exactly what the problem was. They were just worried about their own kingdom. And you know, you'd say to the people, let's unite. And then they'd still have one eye on conquering their Ta'ifa. So we see one of the main causes for the Muslims being defeated was the disunity. We see we saw this happening time and time again, whereby they would be worried about, you know, the other Muslim group and they would begin to have infighting. We see this along with the love of the dunya. We saw this in Andalus. We saw this in uh, Italy. We saw this in Uhud. We see these things happening time and time again. So in Andalus, once they started to break up into these smaller Taifas, it allowed the Christians to attack and, uh, and made them disunited. Now you find that the leaders of the Taifas, there was one of the leaders, he had to make a decision. Now I want you to imagine that you're a leader of one of these Taifas. You're disunited, you can't make unity with your Muslim brothers because you know, they wanna, they, they've got their eyes on your kingdom. What are you going to do? You've got the choice of being conquered by a Christian or you've got a second option. Now this second option, it seems so simple that of course you would want to take this is calling upon the Muslims of North Africa to come assist you. So you're the leader of your country. You can either be conquered by the Christians or you can call on the Muslims of North Africa to come assist you. Sure, I will call for my brothers. It because sounds something it simple. Uh, better than, than a sword on my neck. Mm -hmm. the, uh, North, uh, the North Africans at this time, they were united? 
The North Africans at that time, they were united. There was a group they were called Al-Murabitun. Al-Murabitun comes from Ribat, the one who stands guard to defend the Muslim empire. So the Murabitun, they were the, the Muslims of North Africa in power at that time. We, uh, in history, you find that their name uh, became uh, Spanish, made, uh, yani made like Spanish. They called them the Muravids. In Arabic, we call them the Murabitun. So one of the Muslim leaders, he had to make this decision, which seems simple. So basically, it, is a, uh, it was a tribe or religion kind of uh, two options. Like, if they chose the religion, uh, then they would ask their brothers to help them. But, I mean, there could be too much pride. So The problem that came about wasn't so much because the Murabitun, they're from North Africa. They're not a Ta'ifa on their border. They don't have the same issues. But the reason why they were reluctant, why the leaders of the Ta'ifas didn't want the Murabitun to come, was because you saw over time in Andalus, the people become very, very corrupt. They would listen to music. You'd hear about the leaders, they'd be listening to music. And at this point, they renegated from the Khalifa? This is, forget about that, as we said, the Khalifa is forgotten about. They've broken up into their smaller taifas. They're not even united within Andalus, let alone within the whole Muslim world. You find the leaders promoted music, drinking of alcohol, you know, yeah, parties. Christian propaganda in that time, maybe they, maybe they, uh, do you have a Christian propaganda in that time? In what way? In what way that they will help uh, the spreading of wine, spreading of... Uh, of course, the Christians would take advantage of this. They knew that when the Muslims leave Islam and when you become weak in your Iman, you're going to be susceptible to being attacked. When you love the dunya, you're not going to want to die for the sake of Allah. Maybe also examples, maybe uh, one leader from Taifa, maybe he called Christians to help him. Do we have some of that examples? We have examples like this. We saw as the Muslims became disunited, sometimes they would prefer to get a Christian to assist them to fight a Muslim just to perfect his ta protect his Taifa. Sorry, Musa, but when exactly this happened, that this united? We say last time that they no. sit 800 years. No. 800 years. When exactly they divide? We're going in, this is only after about, three, four hundred, about 300 years in. Hmm. So you find that within these first two, three hundred years, the Muslims became very disunited. After the first hundred years, you, fought, you saw absolute disunity. Then you had these Ta'if estates for the next hundred, hundred and fifty years. Then you had the decision they had to make. The Muslims knew they couldn't hold out. Each one of them couldn't hold out. So eventually one of the leaders, he had to make a decision to unite, uh, to invite the Murabitun. However, you find that if they invited the Murabitun, the Murabitun were pure Ahlul Sunnah Orthodox Muslims. They weren't going to tolerate music and dancing and alcohol. So they had to choose between the dunya, their own desires, and being forced to follow their religion. And the words of one of the leaders of one of the Ta'ifas became immortalized. He made the decision to invite the Murabitun to defend Al-Andalus. And he said, I prefer to be looking after camels in the Sahara Desert than looking after pigs in Castile. Meaning when the Murabitun come, they're going to take him as a prisoner. They're going to send him to the Sahara Desert and he'll be looking after camels. The ruler of the Ta'if. Of course, this ruler, he's a criminal. He's disobeying Islamic law. Murabitun, they're going to get rid of him. When, when they come, they're going to imprison him in the Sahara. He said, better that I live as a Muslim with dignity, as a prisoner, than living as a prisoner of the Kuffar, living under the Christians because in maybe Castile. Because uh, die uh, because of plague or some other diseases. No. Caused by pigs or uh, maybe... Even, uh, even this aside, not, not a thing of cleanliness. It's talking about being proud as a Muslim. If you're going to be a prisoner, better to be a prisoner of a Muslim where you can practice your Islam he not lost than living all without his honor. Imam. He not lost he all his They his still imam. had some Imam. Mm. They still had some Imam. So the Murabitun came, these men who came from the desert. It said that when the Murabitun initially were invited, they brought 6,000 troops from Senegal. 6,000 troops from Senegal, 9,000 North Africans, Arabs and Berbers. And then they also united 10,000 troops of you know true believers from Al Andalus. So was it was it only the one Taif ruler that invited them or all of them? You initially had a few of the Taifas from around Portugal who invited them, but the reality was as soon as the Murabitun come, they're going to take all of the places. Some uh, Taifas, uh, some some rulers of Taifas, do they uh, invite Christians to help me, uh, help uh, to help them uh, 
against uh, Morabi Tunes? No. From this point on, once the Morabi Tun came in, the people realized, uh, again, as the, as the understanding that this other ruler had, better to live as a Muslim. Okay, the Murabi Tun, they're going to come. They're going to stop all of our vices and our sins. But really, it's better under them to hold your head up as a Muslim than to allow yourself to, you know, be a traitor and to invite a Christian. So Even if I love the, uh, the dunya. Murabi Tun were going to go to the... Um to Spain to reform Islam basically because they were deviating from the uh, this, Sunnah. This is what we saw. When the Murabitun came, as I was about to mention, they came not just on horses, they brought camels. These are men from the desert, hardened men from the desert, with their faces covered. You wouldn't see their faces. And they brought, uh, and they brought uh, the people from Senegal. They, they are all blacks. They are yes, and you find it very different to what the Andalusians had become. Most of the Andalusians at that time they took on the culture of Al-Andalus. They had forgotten that they came from the desert. So to see these men riding in with veiled faces on camels and horses, it struck fear into the Muslims, let alone into the, into the Kufar, into the, the non-Muslims. Basically, the Andalusians, they had lost themselves in the dunya and indulged too much. Indeed. And you find the Murabitun, they came number one to liberate the Muslims, and second to set them straight. When the Murabitun came, was there were the Taifa states were they border states or like or like basically were they like little countries within Andalusia? They almost? were very very small countries. So but the Murabitun were invited into Portugal, around Portugal, Spain, and they actually met one of the Christian kings. His name was King Alfonso, and uh, King Alfonso he actually brought the largest Christian army ever assembled in the history of Andalus to fight against the Muslims. Oh, how many? Uh, well, the Muslims had twenty-five thousand. The, the Christians had a larger army than this. The exact number eludes me at the moment. And this battle became known as the Battle of Az-Zalaqa. Az-Zalaqa, it means the slippery grounds. Why was it called the Battle of the Slippery Grounds? Why? Because it was said there was so much blood spilt that the ground became slippery. You couldn't even walk on the ground without slipping on the blood that was spilt. And the Muslims, the Murabitun, punished and completely, utterly destroyed King Alfonso and the Christian troops. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises victory to those that really adhere to the Sunnah. You find, yes. And Allah gave them support. In tansur Allah yansurkum. You support Allah by yani, practicing Islam, Allah will assist you. And then Allah continues in another ayah. Wa in yansurkum Allah, fala ghaliba lakum. And you find this, uh, if Allah assists you, none can defeat you. You find this became the motto of Al Andalus. La ghalib illa Allah. There is no conqueror except Allah. But of course, the condition is that you first obey Allah. You be a believer, then you will find the support from Allah. And that's what we saw when the people slipped back and fell into hypocrisy and the Iman fell. You find they became humiliated and defeated. But when they stayed strong, you found that like the Murabitun, they were successful. Let's see, uh, you know, a rise once again amongst the... The Muslims in Spain? Does yes, you saw, golden age? you saw the Christians were pushed back. And then the Murabitun began to consolidate all of these Taifas, bringing them back under one nation. And they actually took all of Andalus except for one small section. One of the Taifas, they left them. They, they weren't able to take them at that specific time. So the, 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 the Christians take this Taifa? No, this, this Taifa was in the other corner. I th it was actually in the, the, the southeast. So the, most, the, the Christians were pushed back to the northwest. So you, and why, you, why the Murabitun not continue conquer, conquering? Part of the reason, as we mentioned, the Christian states had become very powerful. You know, in their base, it was hard to attack. But one of the main reasons, uh, the leader of the Murabitun at that time, his name was Yusuf ibn Tashfin, rahimahullah, this brave warrior. You found that Yusuf, after coming to see the Muslims and seeing how wicked they were, he started to change them. He brought back orthodoxy. He brought back true Islam. However, at that time, his, uh, his heir, the one who was going to succeed him in North Africa, had actually died. So he had to go back to North Africa to appoint a new heir. Now, this caused a problem because the moment he left Andalus, he didn't have full control anymore. And you found many of the people who were the Munafiqs, the one you know, who were weak in Iman, they started to corrupt the people again. So once again, we have the, this divinity, the, the people who are doing the, uh, the, 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 the things that are uh, hypocrisy. And you found that they started to fall into this. So Yusuf, once he came back uh, uh, from North Africa, 
he saw the people again. They, became, they, they, they were going into sins, and they feared Yusuf. They feared him. You know, the people, the talk of the town is, when is Yusuf coming back? Or in other words, how long can we continue partying that for? He, he uh, came back uh, five or six times. This, after this main time, after he appointed his heir, there was a few years. There was a gap of about five to ten years. Now, when he came back, you found that the people were in fear of this man who was going to force them to come back to their religion. They wanted him. You have to understand, they needed this man. Without him, the Christians would come and defeat them. But at the same time, they lived in fear of him. This, uh, this, this shows the lack of Iman because they should fear Allah over just a man that's coming. This, this overall is a lesson. There's a, uh, actually, this is probably one of my favorite films of all time. There's a, a film called Seven Samurai. It's a, a Japanese film made by Akira Kurosawa. It's a very old black and white film made after World War II. Now you see one of the points in this movie, you find it happening in Andalus, and you find it happening in many, many situations. It's one of these lessons that we learn, where the people needed Yusuf ibn Tashfin. They needed the Murabi Tun to protect them, but at the same time, they were afraid because they were going to force them to their religion. In the movie Seven Samurai, you see there's a, a people of a village, and they need these samurai to, become, to protect them from the robbers. Mm. But at the same time, they say, if the samurai come, our daughters are going to fall in love with them. They're going to marry them and take them away. So they begin to hide their daughters. And when the samurai come, instead of welcome, welcoming them, they hide in their houses. So you've, you've got this paradox of needing the people. You find this is something that we find today. The people want the Mujahideen to come to liberate their lands. They want to hold up their head high and live as Muslims with honor and dignity and freedom. But at the same time, their inner desires are saying, hold on a moment, if these Wahhabis, if these extremists, if these Islamists come, they're going to deprive us of our rights to what? What rights are they afraid of? To drink alcohol, to party. They're going to say, no, they're going to force us to pray in the masjid. Is this what they're afraid of? You see the desires? Push away the actual need that you have. You know, that's uh, also happening. Uh, we could take a lesson from that in today's world. Uh, people saying Islamists, you know, Salafis, Selef you know, uh, what's happening in the Arab world that, you know, Islamists are going to take over and they're going to, you know, do a lot of terrorist acts around the world, but that's not you really the case. Fear. You find it even here in Egypt after the initial, you know, uh, after Mubarak had been ousted. Many of the people said, oh no, the Islamists, you know, they might take power. And you say, what do you fear? Do you fear Allah and His Messenger? Is it the freedom, you know, to, to do these things, to drink? Is this what you fear? Turn back to Allah and you'll be fine. I think that we, will can, we can connect all of these events in Egypt and in the Spain in the past with the ayats. Because they, they care for themselves when they, when they, when they were uh, uh, needing help. They say, Yusuf, come to, come, come to help us. But uh, in the times when they, the, the old things were good, uh, the Christians, they, they, want, uh, they, 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 they aren't attacked. So the Christians, they just returned uh, to, their, the or, or, to their, their ordinary no. activities. Unfortunately, Drinking, this, uh, is, this is what happens. Allah says, this is the human. This is how the human was created. But the true believer overcomes this. Now you say, Alhamdulillah, Yusuf, Ibn Tashfin, rahimahullah, was able to unite all of the Muslim lands. And he actually made it a province of Morocco. And he resubmitted Al-Andalus to the Khalifa. Because remember, we were asking about the, where was the Khalifa at that time. The Ta'if is they had nothing to do with the Khalifa. Yusuf, you see the true belief of this man, a, a, a wise politician, a wise leader. First, he made it a, a, a province of Morocco, and then he submitted Al-Andalus to the rule of the Khalifa in Syria. So this is the point where we're at now. We're going to go for a short break, inshallah, continuing to look at the amazing legacy of Al-Andalus. Join us, uh, our dear viewers, after a short break. A legacy A legacy Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome back viewers, we're here looking at Islamic history with a focus on Al-Andalus So we saw how Yusuf ibn Tashfin rahimahullah had managed to unite all of the Muslim lands He united the Muslims of course by force and then what happened was he submitted the Al-Andalus to the rule of the Khalifa in Syria. And we see the effect that this had. 
because we see when the Muslims were disunited, they were being attacked. Their lands were being reconquered by the Christians. But once Yusuf ibn Tashfin united the Muslims, we found they slowly started to reconquer some of the lands that were taken from the Christians. For example, you had the city of Valencia. Valencia was one of the cities in the north. And this was a Christian city for a long time. Once the Muslims were united under Yusuf and the Murabi Tun, they actually reconquered the city of Valencia. We see this is the, the, the effect. When the Muslims are united, they're strong and they're at the forefront. They're regaining these lost lands. Do they keep the city of Valencia? Do they keep the city? Valencia, of course, eventually towards the end it fell. But at this point, they actually started to regain it. This is the first time since the conquest of Andalus where the Muslims are starting to reconquer lands now because of this unity, because of the wise leadership of, uh, of uh, Yusuf ibn Tashfin rahimahullah. So we see the benefits of this unity. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, uh, he used force to unite the uh, nations again. Muslims of course. Use the force. Yeah. In this point, if you're going to actually sit down and have a meeting and say we should come together, they wouldn't come together. So what he did is he, he brought the believers together. He actually started to reconquer the, the Muslim lands and to bring them under the rule of the one leader. And this is how this should be, to actually have a unity. You're never going to have everyone agreeing to unity. We're going to look at this later on in you know, the Crusades, all of these episodes. It was taken by force, forcing the Muslims to put their desires away, their tribalism away, and to come under the rule of one Amir. You know, Sheikh, I just have a general comment here. I think people should memorize these names because not many people know these heroes of Islam. People only know the European or Western heroes like Benjamin Franklin and stuff like that. But people are very ignorant of these Islamic heroes. Alhamdulillah, mo many Muslims will know these names. And the names, no doubt, we should know, we should know Tariq ibn Ziyad. We should know Yusuf ibn Tashfin. We should know these names. We should have our children memorizing these and knowing these stories. But above uh, everything... Our Bissad said that they, they uh, taught their children also Quran and also the, the, about, the, uh, about the divorce of Prophet, about the Gazawats of, of Prophet. These are the things they must grow up knowing. Otherwise, they're going to waste their time hearing nonsense. But the main lesson that, that, you, that you want to take from this are the lessons. If you don't remember the names, if you don't remember the places or the years, at least you take the lesson of unity, a practical lesson that we see time and time again. So we saw the Muslims, they began to retake Valencia, for example. And this is, you know, you had in Valencia, there was the, the famous uh, Spanish Andalusi, his name was Al Cid. Have the North Africans gone back to North Africa or are they taking control of some of the areas? The, the North Africans at that time, the Murabitun, you mean? Yes. They had taken Al Andalus. It was theirs, and all of North Africa and Andalus was now part of the one Muslim empire, the Khilafah. So we see, as we said, they conquered uh, Valencia, this Christian city. When they conquered these Christian uh, for Valencia, for example, um, did a lot of the Christians convert, or were they just living under the Muslim rule at the time? You'd find that many of them may convert, but you never had one point, you know, where all of Andalus converted. This is, you know, you, you find that the religion wasn't forced upon them you found that the Muslims generally always gave them religious freedom. However, what happened? We're going to hear about this in a moment, insha'Allah. Once Yusuf ibn Tashfin had uh, you know, passed away, rahimahullah, his son, uh, Ali bin Yusuf, he took over. Now, Ali, he was religious. He was a murabit like his father. He was very religious. But he wasn't a wise military leader like his father. You found that he couldn't keep the same grip on Al-Andalus that his father was able to. So the city of Cordoba, which as we remember we mentioned, Cordoba was the largest city in the world at this point. It eventually had a population of one million people. Not only in Europe, in the whole world, the in largest the whole, city. It was the largest uh, city in the whole world. Mm. So we see this Cordoba rebelled against Ali bin Yusuf. So once you have the bigger city rebelling, what do you think the smaller cities are going to do? Rebelling also. They're going to take leads. Mm. So you found that the Muslims again started to become disunited. After being united and seeing the benefit of unity, it's amazing how quickly they would go back to their ta'ifas, go back to their tribalism and nationalism. So you see they became disunited. What do you think happened when they became disunited? The Christians I'm came. Saying, the Christians began to reconquer lands again. Now at this time, you had a new group emerging in North Africa, a group very different to the Murabitun, very religious, 
but with a very different political outlook. They were called al muwahidun the monotheists. So again, you find the Muwahidun, this time they weren't even invited. The Muwahidun, they were invited. The Muwahidun said, Khalas, you people can't look after yourselves. We're going to come look after Al-Andalus for you. Now, as I said, they had a very different outlook to the Murabitun. They took Andalus. They began to unite the lands. However, they were very, very strict with uh, the religious outlook. Sometimes too strict. They would say, the Christians are coming in and they're, you know, they're causing the Muslims to become corrupt. If the Muslim drunk won't drink wine, he'll give him the wine. If he won't play the music, he'll play the music for him. So the Murabitun actually, uh, they gave a mandate that all of the Jews and Christians are to leave Al-Andalus. You either go to the Christian lands or you leave. You can go to North Africa, no problem, because the Muslims there are going to put you in line. But in Andalus, you're not welcome anymore. Uh, now, Sheikh, was this right, uh, uh, what they did, kicking out all the Christians and Jews out of Andalus? Generally speaking, as we said, you know, the, uh, when the Muslims gave them religious freedom, this was respected. This was something that Islam mandates to give respect. In terms of a political tool to say, okay, the Christians are causing too many problems, the Jews are causing too many problems. As a political tool, this failed completely. We're going to take a look at why it failed. One of the things that actually uh, was interesting at this time, and we're looking again at about 1130 here, so the year 1130. Once they actually kicked many of the Jews and the Christians out, there was a very famous Jewish scholar who we mentioned previously. His name was Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, or Maimonides. He was, as we called him, the Ibn Taymiyyah of Judaism. He was the one who formulated, you know, the pillars of Iman for the Jews, taken completely like from the Muslim. Like as in Islam. Yes. So you saw he actually left Al-Andalus. He lived in Andalus. He was an Andalusi. And where did he go? He went to Egypt. He went to a Muslim land. He went to Egypt. Now at this time, do we know who the ruler of Egypt was? It was Salahuddin Al-Ayubi. So we're going into the period of the Crusades here. So whilst Andalus is coming, at, at this area of the Muahidun, we also have the Crusades taking place. And why, why did he choose a, a Muslim country? He over chose a Muslim a country Christian because country. He, he, he couldn't find the same religious freedom in a Christian country. Yes, the Muahidun were tough, but the Christians were even tougher. He found religious freedom in Spain under Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Now, Maimonides was not just a scholar, he was also a physician, a doctor. So when he went to Cairo, when he went to uh, Egypt, he actually became the personal doctor of Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Salahuddin, his personal doctor his, was... His per now, imagine this, imagine Ibn Taymiyyah being the personal doctor for the head Jewish rabbi. You wouldn't find this happening. Or to, to maybe to, uh, to our head of maybe one state, in uh, one Christian state. I yes. That is so absurd. You wouldn't find this happening. But you find the greatest Jewish scholar of all time, according to the Jews, was the personal doctor of Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Wow, I've never heard of this. Yeah, it's like Im Im being a personal doctor to like George Bush or something. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't live at the same time, but <laughs> something along these lines. It's something amazing to see. Again, this is uh, you know, the honor that the Muslim lands had, accommodating you know, these beliefs. So when the Muwahidun you know, uh, became extreme and expelled all of these people, this actually backfired. You found that the Christians would go back to the north, you find the Jews would go back to the north, and they lost trust in the Muslims. The moment you lose trust in the Andalusi Muslims, you're going to plot against them. You're going to want revenge. So this was part of the downfall of the Muwahidun. So uh, Al-Andalus wasn't, wasn't the beam of light as it was before? Or? It, th this was, in my personal opinion, one of the low points. You found, as we said at the same time, the Crusades were happening. Mm. Many of the Crusaders, because you had the Crusade happening on the east of the Mediterranean, but there was another front to the Crusades, which was Al-Andalus. Many of the Crusaders, what they would do is when they'd finished fighting in the Holy Land, in Al-Quds, Jerusalem, they would go back through the Mediterranean and they'd fight the Muslims in Al-Andalus. This is what many of the Crusaders would do. They'd consider this another front on you know, their, their war against the Muslims. So the Crusaders would fight against the Muslims in Sicily. They would fight against the Muslims in Al-Andalus. So you had a big front being fought against the Muslims. And so the Muahidun, they began to lose power. And once they began to lose power, what happened? Disunity. Christians beginning to reconquer many of the lands. Now at the same time you find uh, 
yani one of the reasons why the Murabitun they lost power because the people they became very weak. After yani the Murabitun leaders uh, stayed in power, the actual common people they became weak and they started to lose their Islam. Maybe uh, one of the reasons of maybe fall of uh, Murabituns or also for the fall of uh, Wahidun maybe because they are were Berbers and they were like uh, new people. They are, it they wasn't are, so yeah. much a racial issue. You find that as... Oh, yeah, because, uh, because maybe they are, they are new to that, uh, to, to Andalus, so are, they are new guys. They were new, the Murabitun were also new. They were also new. The problem was the Murabitun became accommodated to Andalus. Because as we said, Andalus was a place of fitna. It was a place where people became crooked. Told the Christians and the Jews to leave because they saw what happened when the Murabitun, when basically the Jews and the this Christians... This is exactly the point. They saw that they were having a bad effect, so they went to the extreme of completely driving them out. So the Murabitun, they lost their Islam. I'm, I'm not saying they lost their Islam, but they lost their Iman. The common people, you know, when they first came, it was said that the Murabitun smashed all of the statues. This is why you go to Alhamra. Alhamra is, you know, one of the big Muslim palaces. It's, you know, some, they consider it like a wonder of the world. A beautiful building. You'll find many statues without faces. Why? They'd been smashed. By who? By the Murabitun. The Murabitun came this and said, this is haram. This is, you know, uh, this is a making of images. They smashed them. Because this is maybe, the, uh, I think that, uh, the, that, that the Andalusian, they imitate the Christians in, the, in on that time. In that yes, time. they began to adopt many un-Islamic practices. So no, the Murabitun, they smashed them. After a few generations, they were building them again. You found that they, their Iman became weak. Andalus, in many ways, it became like a place of fitna, where you'd come out of the desert, pure, and then you'd come and you'd become corrupted. You wouldn't become corrupted, but your children would. This is like in the West. Many people, they come from a Muslim land. Their Islam is strong and they think, it's okay, I'll migrate. I'll go work for a little while. My children will be fine. And then you find their children, no longer Muhammad, call me Mo. No longer Suleiman, call me Sam. They're listening to music. They're wasting time to the, going to the The same thing that happened in Andalus. If we see this is happening, why do we continue to do this? You have to be wise. You have to understand what you're putting yourself into. So this was the fall of the Murabitun. Maybe we haven't learned uh, anything from history. We must, if we, if uh, we learn from history, we wouldn't do th th this thing. We wouldn't uh, do that. We have to be wise. We have to be wise. You know, we can't say that, you know, you shouldn't go into Andalus. But you should have a proper understanding, looking after your children. It's not enough to just come and say, I am going to establish Islam in my household and not worry about the next generation. You have to think generations ahead. You have to think about the fitness they are going to face. You have to worry about these. Otherwise, if you don't set up a whole structure, the community, your children are going to become misled. But it also looks like it's a, a question of leadership because the examples that you've given, you know, you gave the example of uh, Yusuf ibn Tashfin. Uh, you know, he was a great leader. And uh, some other uh, examples that you've given, you know, but then when, you, when you're without this leader, you see a lack of unity, you see the community starting to uh, get corrupted, etc. Indeed. If you, later on, if you are going to have, you know, leaders who aren't like Yusuf, you're going to have leaders who are lacking, they don't have the same understanding, they're going to mislead the people. And this is what happened slowly. It happened first with his son Ali, where he had the religiousness, but he didn't have the military uh, tactical uh, sides. He didn't have the, he wasn't the best of politicians. Because we know Islam is not just a deen. It's not just a deen in the sense that you go to the masjid and you worship. Islam is also a dawla. Islam is a state. Islam is politics. Islam is ruling over a people. And if you only have the religious side and you pray in the masjid all day and you remember Allah, it doesn't necessitate that the people are going to actually listen and obey you. This is why you need to be a wise, powerful tactician, politician and ruler. And why the Khalifa in this time not send other leader? At that time, the Khalifa, he started to lose power. After Yusuf gave Andalus to the, khul to the Khalifa, you found that eventually after this, the people said, we'll rebel, we're no longer under the power of the Khalifa. And the Khalifa didn't have the army to go to send the people. He didn't have the resources at that time. You know, the Khalifa in Syria, he wasn't able to send forces in. So this was the downfall of the Murabitun. The Muwahidun, you find that the defeat happened slowly, slowly. 
as we said, first they drove out the Jews and the Christians, and then they began to plot and plan. So you found they started to invade from the north. You found from the south, the Christians you know, coming back from the Crusades, they started to invade. Slowly, slowly, uh, the, you know, the, the Muwahid uh, Empire, it began to disintegrate until it, uh, only probably a few Ta'ifas were left. So this is the downfall that we see. You know, inshallah, the next episode we're going to go into a little bit more detail about exactly the fall of Al-Andalus. But we see no doubt in this part of Al-Andalus, the main lessons are no doubt unity. Because if we're not united, what's going to happen? What did we see happening? The Islamic Empire, empire will eventually fall. The when the Muslims from the other, the, the disbelievers or the Christians in this example, they'll come and take advantage. They're going to disunite us, we're going to become weak. And when are the Muslims at their strongest point? They will conquer the world. And when, when are they at that point? When they were united, when they were, uh, uh, when they were like a uh, real Muslims, when they, they when they, uh, Im uh, when they uh, uh, haven't, uh, they hadn't imitate the, imitate the Christians. No. When they have iman. When they were united and they were following their religion. We see there's a common saying, al ittihadu quwwa. Unity is uh, strength. Wa furqa adab. And, you know, being split amongst yourselves. Division is a punishment. It is uh, a cause of defeat. And Allah tells us time and time and again. He says, وَعَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold fast to the rope of Allah, meaning the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and do not become disunited amongst yourselves. We see time and time again the effects of this. Sicily and Andalus are prime examples of what happens once you become disunited. Now it's easy to say, this is Andalus. You know, this is what happened then. When I'm the ruler of Andalus, I'll be united. But the reality is we're not going to become the ruler of Andalus. But we are going to deal with our own families. We are going to deal with our own masjids and our own communities. Are we going to be the ones who cause disunity? Who use, you know, nationalism and tribalism? Or are we going to be the ones who push the ego aside for the sake of the Muslims? And some people think that that stuff happened a very, very long time ago and we, we don't take anything from it. But actually, history repeats itself. And we could take many lessons from what happened in Andalus or what happened during the Prophet's time, no. during the Battle of Uhud. No doubt it repeats itself. It repeats itself on a large scale and on the smaller scale. So as I was saying, it's not enough to say, you know, when I'm the Khalifa, I will do this. You're already the Khalifa of your household. You're already the, you might be the Imam of your community. And we find how often, very unfortunate, that the Muslim leaders, especially in the West, you find this, they plot against each other. They say, well, I'm from, you know, the, the, the Turkish masjid and you're from the Lebanese masjid. We do it our way, you do it your way. How do you think the Muslim Ummah is going to feel is seeing the Muslims disunited? Actually happening now? You find this happens. You find, especially like in Australia, you had this problem when the first wave of immigrants started to come. They'd have a mosque and out the front it would say in big letters, Albanian masjids. The khutbah would be in Albanian, even though the majority of the Jama'ah, they're Somali. They don't understand what the Imam is saying. What is the point of this? Just for the sake of your nationalism? This shows um, basically they're already a minority in the country and they're just making a bigger minority. They're making themselves even smaller. <laughs> you, exactly. When you're a minority, you need to be united more than ever. But the problem is that when you're, when you're small and things are comfortable and you're not being attacked, like as we saw, Andalus, it was you know, a strong empire. So the people could sit back comfortably and say, I'm going to follow my desires. I'm going to chase the dunya and then I'm going to become disunited. It isn't until the fitna comes that you feel the need for unity. Not only are people uh, split up because of race in today's world, they're also split up because of the different Islamic thoughts like methods. People won't pray behind a, a man because he's a part of a certain method. No, we find this came to a peak. It came to a peak in where? In Makkah. You could imagine Makkah. You go to Makkah today, everybody prays behind the one Imam. There was a point in our history where f you would have four Jama'as. For example, Maghrib prayer. The first Imam would come from, for example, the Hanafi Madhab, and he would lead the Hanafis. Then the Shafi'i would come. Then the Hanbali would come. Then the Maliki would come. And each one, this is Makkah, Makkah, each one praying behind their own Imam. This unity in the Kaaba. How, how could this be? We have one Imam only. 
we should. This is ideal. You're talking about ideal. We have it today. But what happened before? Now, it's easy to say today, khalas, we have the one imam. What's the problem? But then, when we are the ones in our own masjids, in our own communities, start using these things, my madhab, my manhaj, I am right and you are wrong. We haven't learned the lessons of disunity. And this came to a, a peak in Mecca. And again, the Muslims weren't united by sitting down and discussing our problems. It's not as if these, you know, the, the, the four imams of the madhahib at this time, they said, well, let us just elect one of us. No, no, no. Their desires, their ego was too strong. How were they united? By force. They were united only by force. We're going to see this as a constant time and time again. We're going to have a very short break, inshallah. So we've looked at all of these lessons. Keep these in mind. And our dear viewers, we hope that you'll join you. Uh, we hope that you will join us after a short moment after this break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to your viewers where we're looking at Islamic history with a focus on Al Andalus. So we've looked at the lessons of the Muslims when they were united and strong and when they disunited and weak and when they left their religion. There's a, actually a beautiful story, a, a story which epitomizes much of why the Muslims became weak and began to lose their power. It's a very well known story where once the Christians they sent a spy into Al Andalus and this spy he went to go check on the situation of the Muslims. And he saw a, a young Muslim boy. And this boy, he was crying. So the, the, the Christian uh, from the north, he came to him and he said, why are, you, why are you crying? And he said to him, I'm crying because I'm playing you know, with my bow and arrow and I can only kill one bird at a time. What the problem? Usually I can kill two birds. Usually with one arrow, I can kill two birds. But he was upset because he could only kill one bird with an arrow. This shows the marksmanship. We know the Prophet ﷺ told, you, uh, told us to teach our children one of the things, you know, the bow and arrow, marksmanship, shooting. Now, this was the situation of the Muslims. They were powerful. He was an excellent shooter for a, for a boy. You know, for a boy. For a boy to, uh, to, to, shoot, uh, to, to uh, be able to shoot at uh, two birds. You know, imagine, I think uh, that we don't have so much prof uh, professionals who can uh, kill two birds. I think we'd no. be lucky in our days, fortunate to find someone who can fire the bow and arrow. <laughs> all, all, pe all young people do today is uh, watch soccer matches and play video games. Unfortunately, and we see what happened. So this is what happened first. The spy, he saw the Muslims. He went back to his people and he, he said, this is not the time to invade. This is not the time to invade. He was sent uh, uh, maybe a... Uh, uh uh, g uh, girls or some something like this. Uh, like like in, in, in nowadays, we can saw that uh, the majority of programs which are coming from the West are about uh, only about dunya, about this uh, about this world. How they are just telling us there is no ahira, there is no another no. world. Th you this see, is the this only. is actually what happened. It culminated whilst they didn't have any specific plan to do so. Later on, another spy was sent. Perhaps a generation later, for example, another spy was sent. Again, to check the situation of the Muslims, scouting, you know, uh, whether or not the, the time would be good for the invasion. Now, this spy, he, again, he found a Muslim boy crying. You know, a teenager. So he said to him, you know, what is it? Why are you crying? And he said, I'm crying because my girlfriend broke up with me for another guy. Ask is living in our times. In our <laughs> times. Time yeah. So we see the first situation, the Muslims were strong. The children were educated, following Islam powerful the second situation the muslims they're following the dunya. they forgot about you know the marksmanship they forgot about this they're chasing boys and girls and this what do you think the christian said he went back home and he said now is the time now is the time to attack muslim was he right of course he was right because now the muslims they're chasing the dunya and once you do this once you abandon islam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the prophet informed us once you do this once you abandon all of these things, you follow the world, you chase your desires, you abandon jihad, you will be humiliated. This is what the Prophet ﷺ told us, until you turn back to your religion. You can notice how is, history is repeating his, uh, uh, itself. Because we, uh, we nowday, nowadays, in, uh, our, in our time, we can see these problems, in, which, we, which we had in Andals, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, before uh, 60 or, or 70, 
thousand, uh, sixty or seventy hundred years. We have no. these problems in in our maybe in, in our neighborhoods. In like it, like it, history is not about past. It's about uh, only a present time and uh, also about the future. Definitely so. You find as well at that time in Andalus, you find that the people were educated. They weren't just you know they weren't just wasting their time watching movies or reading romance novels you find the people were educated there's a story which really demonstrates this the khalifa of the muslims at a specific time he wanted to find a wife for his son his son you know he's at the age to get married so he he sent a proclamation to the people of al andalus of uh, Cordoba, sorry the city of Cordoba. he said whoever has a daughter that's at the age of marriage meaning perhaps between 15 and you know 22 for example a daughter at the age of marriage who has memorized the entire Quran, I want them to put a candle in their windowsill tonight. It was said that night, the city of Granada, uh, sorry, the city of Cordoba was lit up. Really? Whoa. The city was lit up. What does the Khalifa do? How does he choose? <laughs> so he sent another proclamation. He said to the people, okay, whoever has a daughter of the age of marriage, memorize the whole Quran, and also one of the books of Maliki Fiqh, I want you to put a candle in your window tonight. Would you be... Do we, do we have, do, so do we now have uh, two candles on each uh, window? <laughs> no, if you've got someone to do this, put, just put a candle. Now, again, in honesty, if we were to look at ourselves today, to find, you know, uh, not a man, we forget about the men, a, a Muslim dog. woman, a girl, really memorize dog. the Quran, plus a book of fiqh. You will never find any candle. You might get one <laughs> candle in the whole world. This shows the situation of education now and then. Now, when this proclamation was made, they said the next night there were many, not as much as the first night, but there were still far too many candles to be able to choose one woman. This shows that you know, the, the, the healthy situation of the Muslim Ummah, when the women are educated, then the Ummah is strong. So because how he chose uh, the wife for, for his son? We don't know who he chose. <laughs> Eventually, I'm sure the, the son, he, chose, he, he found the woman. But it shows how strong the Ummah was at that time. You know, there's a, there's a saying of uh, Malcolm X, who we're going to talk about in our episode about the USA, inshallah. He had a beautiful saying which I love. He said, when you educate a woman, you're educating a nation. Yeah, because the, uh, the mothers, they are, they are uh, teachers of Ummah. They're the teachers of the children. Mm. They're the ones who are going, they're going to be with the children yeah, yeah, all exactly day. Yeah, exactly in Bosnia. During the communist time, uh, the mothers and the uh, grandmothers were, were uh, that people uh, who, who saved Islam in Bosnia. No. They weren't men, because the majority of men, they were in the Communist Party. They were out working and... Yeah, out working. The, the mother, the mother is uh, like, like, uh, like a pillar of a house. Because we have in Bosnia a proverb, uh, we said, uh, we have uh, four pillars of a man. Of a man, of a... Uh, if we have one pillar, it's a pillar of, of soul. It is all this uh, ibadat, all these uh, pra prayers, uh, all this uh, fast, fasting. If we have uh, another pillar, it is a pillar of heart. This is a, a, a manner about uh, uh, how we will we'll obey, uh, how will we will uh, do we be. And we have, the, we have the third pillar, it is a pillar of, of a body. It is li like uh, all these uh, desires uh, for, for, a food, for, the, for a food, for a food, for a drink. And the fourth is a woman. Yes, so no doubt. I would take it even further and say the woman is the pillar of society completely. So it, this was the situation of education in Al-Andalus. This was their piety and their devotion to Islam. And this is when they were strong. So we finish here, inshallah, taking a look at the peak of Al-Andalus. The next episode, once we return tomorrow, inshallah, we're going to be looking at the fall of Andalus. And we already know in advance some of the reasons why. But we're going to find out exactly. Then we're going to speak about the legacy of Al-Andalus, inshallah. So dear viewers, may Allah reward you for joining us. We hope that you found as much benefit from this as we did. We hope to see you for the coming episodes, inshallah. May Allah reward you and keep us all steadfast upon Islam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.